Hello, I'd like to talk to you today about epistemology, but before I get on to that, I'd like to say that epistemology, this unit, represents us being about halfway through the course, so hopefully that's good news for you. Um, epistemology is the study of how we know things. It's also the study of truth, belief, and justification. But by way of an introduction to epistemology, I'd like to ask you to think, if you can, about when was the last time that you had the head spins? And I'm not talking about, oh, I'm feeling a little bit dizzy, I better sit down. I'm talking about full on room spinning, I'm imminently going to vomit, head spins. I'm assuming that most of you have had that experience in your life. If you haven't, don't go looking for it. It's not very pleasant. But the reason that I mention it is twofold. Firstly, if you, it, it has to do with the idea of mind-body dualism. In other words, when you wake up or, or <laughs> when you find that you're having these head spins, the room seems to be spinning wildly. There's a part of your mind that knows that it isn't, but your body, your senses, are telling you that it is. So there's that separation there, right, between your body and your mind. And actually, when you think about it even more specifically, it's really only, there's a small part of your mind saying the room isn't spinning, and there's also a small part of your mind saying, oh yeah, it is. When, the reason for that, of course, is the, the cochlea in your ear, which is what tells your brain whether or not you're balanced, is for whatever reason telling your brain, no, everything's spinning around like crazy. So like I say, there's a part, there's a rational part of your brain that's saying, no, everything's fine. And then there's this part of your brain that's attached to your, to your senses, if you like, which is saying, no, there's something wrong here. This room is spinning. So that's classic Descartian mind-body dualism. The other thing about it is that it has to do with the, this, this sense of, again, think back to the, the experience, if you can, knowing that the room isn't spinning, but how can you prove that the room isn't spinning? There's a part of your brain that's telling you very strongly that the room is, in fact, spinning. I guess a philosopher would say that there's two ways of looking at that. There's the rationalist, that, that part saying, well, if it was spinning, there would be things flying off the bookshelves and off the tabletops. And the empiricist, which would say, well, I don't think the room is spinning. It might appear to be spinning. Let's do some experiments to find out. But I digress. I do want to underscore the fact that both rationalism and empiricism, those things that we started talking about in the metaphysics unit, also impact the epistemology unit. Have a look at this graphic. I'll put that up on my newsfeed so you can have a look at it later. Basically, epistemologists identify knowledge or break knowledge down into to three separate subcategories. There's what's called prepositional knowledge or knowledge that. In other words, you know that two plus two equals four. There's also knowledge how. You know how to add two plus two to, to make four. And then there's finally what's called associational knowledge, which is, <clears throat> uh, for example, uh, people, places, and things that you know from your experience. Um, so for example, you know that I'm teaching this online philosophy course because you've been taking part in it for, you know, up until now. Epistemology is based on logic. And logic is defined for philosophers as everything that can be truthfully said about something based on 
what is already known to be true. For philosophers, logic is deductive. So an example of that is Aristotle's favorite saying, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Or inductive, inductive logic is, uh, for example, um, all the crows that I have seen are black, therefore I assume that all crows are black. But logic is expressed through philosophy in what is known as dialectic. Dialectic is a form of argument. Um, our modern debates are based on this ancient form. And basically what it is, is a way of comparing something with other things to arrive at its qualities by what it is not. So take, for example, courage. So there's a famous dialectic wherein, <coughs> excuse me, Socrates is talking with the general about what courage is. And the general says, Socrates says, well, you're so famous here. You've obviously been in a lot of military conflicts. You've seen what courage is. Tell us what courage is. And the general offers up a definition. And Socrates says, oh, that's great. Uh, I love that. But could it also be this? And the general says, well, I guess it could also be that, yes. And then Socrates says, well, then it's this and this. Could it be this as well? And then they end up in this kind of discussion back and forth and this comparison of what the qualities of courage are. And of course, as we know from looking at Socrates, the, the original definition gets blown out of the water and the general, in this case, ends up feeling foolish. We're going to do a little bit with dialectic in this unit. It's a powerful tool for coming to terms with an idea. It's uh, still used by philosophers today. And I think one of the great strengths of it is the capacity for synthesis. And by that I mean, one of the great criticisms of rationalism is that it's okay for thinking about questions like what is beauty but not as good as find answering questions that are more say mathy sciency whereas empiricism is traditionally used in a math science kind of way but is less good at answering questions like is there a god the thing about dialectic that's powerful is that can actually be used to create a synthesis that allows us to combine the strengths of both of those forms of reasoning to arrive at a much stronger argument in the end.